Each time you eat, you ask yourself where this food came from. Who made this food? Who created this meal? These are questions consumers should ask themselves and should know the answers to. For that reason, they should talk to the producers themselves, the farmers. Lucky for us, farming is in the backbone of our small towns of Kent, Sharon, Salisbury, North Keenan, Falls Village, and Cornwall. But dairy farming consistently flourishes above all. Our dairy farms have started in many different ways, grown abstractly, and have developed and innovated properly and intelligently, all to create a delicious quality product. No. So, this is dairy farming. Technically, Freud's farm came to be in December, well, let's say January 1949. So. Uh, my grandfather moved up from New York City after serving in the war and he met my grandmother who is a native of East Canaan and um, they got married December 25th, 1948 and together they started this dairy farm. So we're about 70 years more or less in being here um, at this place. Um, so we are in a really unique position here at this farm that we had a really good year in 2014 and wanted to reinvest in this business because their next generation was back and active on the farm. There's alley scrapers that are cleaning the alleys where our cows are. We've got uh, misting fans that are actually controlled by the thermostat. So when it's hotter, they're turned on at a higher speed. Um, and when it's cooler, they slow down. The curtains are also controlled by the thermostat. So this, this barn is basically climate controlled. Um, and so there's the optimal temperature for a cow is basically between 25 and 55. So we, during the summer months, try to keep this as cool as possible. Um, and we've got five robots that are milking our cows. So there's still a lot of human involvement in this dairy barn, but not with the actual daily task of milking. Um, and that's all based on um, they're wearing collars and those collars are actually recording their activity and their rumination so that if any cow starts to chew less in a day, she might have a bellyache. And we can be alerted to that with our computer and the software and we can come and treat her. So we're watching each of these cows on an individual basis based on basically technology that we're using for humans as well. So like a Fitbit is kind of what we track our own health and, and activity with. That's what we're doing with our cows. Um, we have a methane digester, so we're actually capturing methane um, from our cow's manure, and we're utilizing that as a biogas and burning that in place of propane or heating oil. Um, we'll soon see my feed pusher, which is also a robot, come up and help push the feed back closer to the cows. Um, and while it's doing that, it's making a chirping sound. And so my cows have become acclimated to that chirping sound also means that they have fresh feed pushed up. Um, and all of our cows have water beds, which is pretty cool. We have what's called a green stall. And so it's just like a plastic tube instead of the conventional standard metal um, kind of U-shaped bar that goes between each bed, we have just a plastic tube. And so there's benefits to that in that if a cow gets a little bit sideways or crooked, she can more easily get out without human assistance. Um, but they also have a tendency to just lie crooked. And so a cow might take up two parking spots instead of one. And so um, we're still trying to get our cows to understand how to lay straight in a bed. Um, but so that's what the reason that we installed those is because it allows us to be a little bit more compact with our bed so that we didn't have to build a bigger barn. And so the bigger the barn, the more expensive it costs to, to build it. So that was an economic kind of decision. It was in the mid 1990s that we, we formed with the other dairy farms in this valley um, a cooperative called the Canaan Valley Agricultural Cooperative. So our milk is 
um, marketed through our dairy co-op, which is Cabot, but we also realized that our cows are making a lot of manure too. So there's obviously value to their milk, that's why we're in business, but we think there's also value to their manure, um, but we need to manage it both on this farm and on all the farms that are here in this valley. So 23 years ago, we started working with our neighbor farms. Um, and so in three weeks, we're having our, I think it's our 23rd annual meeting as the Canaan Valley Ag Cooperative. And the sole purpose of that is manure management. How do we work together to make sure that we're all protecting the river that runs through our farms? And so one of the ideas that came from that collaboration of these farmers coming together and meeting with representatives from the Department of Agriculture, Department of Environmental Protection, uh, the USDA, was how do we think outside the box? And one of the representatives from Department of Ag said, why don't you make a flower pot? And my dad took that seriously. And he has since, that was late 90s, and he spent probably about 10 years just trial and error, research and development, and mixing together some manure fibers with some other ingredients. And finally, in 2006, we had our first official pot made from cow manure, and we started marketing it. Um, that fall, we hosted Mike Rowe, who came out to air a show for Dirty Jobs, which was on Discovery Channel. And so to today, here we are many years later, um, we're manufacturing 12 different sizes of a horticultural pot that is meant to be a biodegradable pot. So you fill it with potting soil, you plant your seed, and you put that whole pot in the ground so you're not disturbing peat bogs, which are not renewable. It takes about 100 years to regenerate. And you're not using plastic, which would otherwise end up in the landfill and you're actually using a product that you want to be putting in your garden. It's cow manure, um, and it's adding value to a byproduct. Our cows are going to poop every day, whether we want them to or not. Um, and so by making pots out of it, we actually have an income stream marketing the stuff that would otherwise cost us money to deal with it. So it's been part of our diversification on this farm. Um, while it's also solving a environmental concern um, because if we don't sell that manure we need to figure out how to put it out in our fields in a responsible way. The town of Canaan is a town with industry and agriculture. I mean I think that's what what population we do have here has very much been supported by Becton Dickinson and Pfizer um, the lime quarries, so, and I think agriculture is a big player in that. Um, and I think something to be really proud of is the fact that um, there's a lot of farms going out of business all over the country, especially dairy farms, but the fact that here in Canaan we still have a really incredible group of farms that are alive and well. Um, so, you know, we've got two dairy farms on either side of us, two more in the valley. Um, and so there's the obvious effect of like us being able to work, um, together with respect to services that are provided to our farms. So when, you know, the nutritionist is coming through, he's not just coming down to one farm, he can go to a couple farms. Um, and the fact that our neighbors get to appreciate a lot of open space. A lot of the value that comes with living in rural America, um, obviously we don't have a lot of fancy restaurants or uh, cultural activities per se, um, but I think that the people that live in this community live here because they appreciate having the big open fields and being able to go hiking or um, hunting or whatever recreational activities are associated with big open space. And that's, I think, a big aspect of what we contribute um, to this community along with being a source of local food. So here in Connecticut, we're actually a milk deficit state. So we don't produce as much as what the total population of the state consumes. 
Um, so it feels good to know that every drop of milk that's coming from these cows is being consumed in a tri-state area. So I think there's, especially now, I think people really appreciate knowing um, who their farmer is and how food is produced. So, you know, two falls ago when we hosted our Open Farm Sunday, even though it was a rainy, crappy, cold October day, we had close to 500 people show up from the area because they want to come see kind of how, how food is produced. So we get to be that bridge for people. Sustainability is a big, big aspect on this farm. Right underneath the sign that says that we're members of Agrimark and the Cabot Creamery Cooperative, we also have a sign that says that we were the winner of a U.S. Innovation Center Dairy Sustainability Award. So we are incredibly focused on sustainability here because we have a limited land base. The five to six hundred acres of cropland we have, that's all we've got. There is no new land out there for us to be able to crop on. And so we need to manage that as a resource. So we need to be obviously very cost effective in how we do it because we don't have a lot of spare money. Um, but we also need to be really mindful of each of our practices on that field to generate a really good yield of that crop, but also to provide the nutrients we need for these cows this year, next year, and the year after that. Um, and so when we talk about farming, we talk about it generationally. So when I introduce myself, I say I'm a third generation farmer. And so we, that's our mindset. Like we're thinking about how do we ensure that this place is here for the next generation. And I think that allows us to be very sustainably minded. Um, and so there's, I mean, just these rumination collars, they're allowing us to track each cow so closely that we can prevent her from needing medication and maybe just needing uh, like a Tums because she has a bellyache. And so that's part of sustainability because we're keeping our cows healthier. They're living longer um, because they're more comfortable. Um, and we're also spending less on inputs. So we don't need to buy as much medicine if we can treat her symptoms early enough on. Um, so for me, sustainability is, it's, it's the three stool, three legs of the stool. It's environmental, so we're ever mindful of how we manage our 600 acres of cropland. It's economic. If we're not making money, if we're not making enough money to be able to cover our costs here, including labor and turning the lights on, and we can't continue to operate as a business, then there's nothing, it doesn't matter how sustainable we are with the environment. If we can't stay in business, then there's no sustainability at all. Um, and then it's social. So are we making sure that the people that are involved with this business um, are happy, healthy, and comfortable? And that's treating your employees right and inviting the community to come see what you do. So I think we're really mindful of those three aspects. In fact, the mission for our business um, specifically addresses sustainability. So like it's at the core of what we do. The future of agriculture relies on farmers connecting with their neighbors and the consumers of our products. And it's being vocal at a school meeting or a town hall meeting. It's, it's making sure that we're present for community-based activities because that disconnect, I think, has led to the disconnect of people questioning the safety and, and healthfulness of the food in the grocery store has resulted in a lot of, like, people are very concerned and questioning whether things were made in a responsible, sustainable, safe way. And there's a lot of concerns about animal welfare. And so I think to combat that, the future for all of agriculture across the country, not, not just Canaan, but especially Canaan, is, is 
being a resource, being open to having guests on my farm, um, reaching out to the school or the local Girl Scout troop to invite them to engage with us in some way. Maybe there's a biology class or a, um, a Girl Scout badge that can be associated with something that we're doing here. Um, I think that um, it's a difficult industry to be in because it's 365 days a year and there is a generational difference between my dad who's a Gen Xer and me who's a millennial because my my expectations for what a work week should look like or what I want it to look like is different than it was for him so I think that Farming just needs to continue to evolve to meet the needs of both the farmers and the consumers. We've been very, I think part of the reason that the farms in our community have had the next generation come back and participate in the farms, because that's not the case for a lot of farms across the country, um, is that there is, there is a strong community here. Um, and there's a great support network within the ag community, but also outside of it. And um, I think, I mean, I read different articles about people being, you know, pushed off their farmland because the neighbors wanted to build a subdivision or something. And I feel like I know that lots can change, um, but to date, I think we've been very fortunate to have a community and a neighborhood that really respects what we do here. And um, obviously having my mom's farm market be a kind of public facing space where people can come in and, you know, ask questions about what we're doing is, is a really big deal for us. Um, but I think that also the reality for farming going forward is diversification isn't an option anymore. I think it's necessary. It will be hard to support a few families off of just milking 300 cows. I don't know that it's going to be viable moving forward. And that's where having the farm market and bakery and the cow pets business are what will potentially allow this business to stay viable. But it is proving to be very difficult to produce a commodity, because milk is basically a commodity, um, to produce it on this scale. Um, we're technically a small farm when you compare us to what, you know, the national average is looking to be. So um, it's a lot of work, but I'm incredibly proud of the product that we make. I never, ever, ever question the safety and healthfulness of a gallon of milk when I'm at the grocery store. And there's a lot of power to knowing that your food comes from a good place. Laurel Brook Farm started um, back almost 70 years ago in 1948 when my grandfather uh, started farming. He married his high school sweetheart and started milking 18 cows. So that's what that was the roots of the farm as it is today. And um, they were, uh, this is the, that was the first generation of actually farming, so it was very new to them, and they were really hard times of getting money and all of that type of stuff back then to continue farming. I think the, some of the biggest lessons they learned is they wanted to do a lot of things themselves. And of course, when you're farmers, weather is a big, a big factor, and you need to make sure that your health is in good shape. And that was all challenged in their first couple of years because when he was uh, uh, 22 years old, just a couple of years into uh, milking cows, he had lost his leg in a, uh, in a baler accident. So that was a huge setback for, at that time, just my grandmother as, as helping at the farm. So she was doing all of the chores as long as a, with a, a lot of friends. So those are things that you don't expect but are big changes, but it's determination that um, I think farmers have and the willingness to uh, really want to overcome a lot of that stuff that he was able to work through that. A couple years later it was um, some devastating weather had come through this area 
the farm was almost washed away with the flood of 1955, where all of their corn was um, underwater. In fact, there was the, the story of it was actually fish up around the ears or the, yeah, the ears at the, uh, on the stalks of corn. So the river was really high. In fact, we've never seen any, any type of flooding like that since then, but those were times were very challenging. So if you don't have your crops to feed your, your animals, you have to get it from another place. And that was a time that they said they almost um, had lost everything. So those were some memorable points for them, um, you know, growing up and the determination to farm. My dad uh, joined the farm in 1969 and they had continually been growing the cow numbers up until then. When he got out of high school, um, they built the first freestall barn in the area. It might have been just a couple around a freestall barn versus a stanchion barn. The freestall barn was loose housing for cattle. And that was just a new technology at the time. And um, it allowed them to have about 200 cows in a barn, but then the cows had to go to a milking parlor to be milked. And at the milking parlor, there was about, uh, there was 12 cows being milked at a time by one person. So there was a lot of efficiencies that were being gained uh, through that and more growth occurred in the years after. Growing up, I was always on the farm with my, with my brother, um, attended high school, um, 88, 91 in that time frame. And the FFA was a, a big part of uh, kind of a game changer for me because it really confirmed what I wanted to do in life. It was, it was a point where I knew agriculture, I knew dairy is what I wanted to be involved with. Same with my brother. At that time, I was the herd manager for the cows. We had 340 milking cows when I graduated uh, in 91. And my brother and I joined the partnership um, right there uh, a senior year of high school. So now that we were the third generation on the farm, and uh, again, still growing the farm just because another family um, needs to live off of the farm and the earnings, and we had to add more cows. So the farm grew, and um, the next expansion phase for us was in, uh, in 1992. Technology, again, there was a lot of new technology being involved with the dairy, uh, for dairy farming. We had built a very large milking parlor um, so that we could milk 150 to 200 cows in one hour. We could milk all of the cows that we had at the time in two and a half to three hours and we were at about 500, 550 milking cows then. So, and at that point we introduced automatic um, takeoffs for the cows. So that means when the cow is milking, when she's done milking, the machines automatically come off. It just created faster throughput um, and um, it was a technology that, was, that we utilized at that point. So from there we were again steadily growing um, until we're now currently at 1,200 milking cows. There can be 14 family members on the farm um, on a given day, so we are a very large family operation. And there's the fourth generation now at the farm with my two nephews that have joined um, the partnership just this past, this past year. So it's pretty exciting that we have a legacy that we're trying to carry on for future generations. And um, we wanna be able to get more output out of the land that we have. We want to be able to um, just do more things that are environmentally friendly. We want to do things that are more sustainable. We want to just do the right thing for the land so that we can leave this place a better place for the next generation. So having a farm with 1,200 milking cows, you also have 1,200 of the female replacements. So all of their calves we raise. And one might ask, how do you manage that many cows? And it's through technology, it's through computer systems, it's through individual cow monitoring, it's with dedicated employees as well. So the computer systems are a big part of how we manage these cows. We actually have multiple herdsmen now. We have dedicated calf feeders. We have herd managers. We have uh, milkers now. So people are 
really dedicated professionals in each of those areas. And it's through management training um, with our employees, through the use of technology, whether it might be um, even camera monitoring systems, daily milk weights on cows, pedometers, where we, we monitor the footsteps that these cows walk. And it's just 24 hour surveillance of the herd now. We're able to manage these cows really truly better than we ever uh, were used to be able to do before. New innovations and new technologies in agriculture, it seems like it happens, it's all the time. It's always evolving and we're always looking for those technologies to advance us in the future. A couple of years ago, we built a, a new freestall barn. I mentioned we did one back in 1970, but the one that we have today has mattresses or water beds underneath the cows for cow comfort. We use kiln dried sawdust for bedding. We have fans in there for cooling and every cow has a place to lay down as long and they also have adequate um, water and feed 24 hours a day. They are also, um, the, there's curtain sidewalls that control the airflow through the barn. They're all temperature controlled on thermostat. As dairy farmers, we're proud to be the great stewards of the land. What does that mean and what does that entail? Well, it's around the word sustainability. Sustainability has many parts to it, but to be a steward of the land, what we're trying to do is make sure that we're not over applying nutrients back onto the soil more than what we take off with our crop every year. So it's a, it's a real balance. That's one example that we do. We understand that there's um, when there's uh, abnormal weather patterns, we could have runoff of water through our, our fields and have erosion. Therefore, we use a cover crop. We use a cover crop of rye. That rye can also be fed to the cows. But the rye holds the soil in place and allows for uh, erosion to be minimized so that it doesn't get into our, our streams and, and brooks that are in all of our backyards that we enjoy uh, certainly fishing and that type of stuff every year. For the last 15 years, we've done no-till planting as well on our fields. This allows us not to disturb the soils and loosen them up so that we do not get the erosion off in the rivers. So between no-till uh, of the of planting, the crops are growing. When we harvest the crops, we put a cover crop back on them so that our fields are green 365 days a year. Underneath the snow, there may be a green cover crop underneath that. There's life on the soil year round. Laurel Brook Natural Resources is on 340 acres, which is an operating mine and, and, and gravel operation. The vision down the road is that we're gonna mine some of those resources out, not create a lake or a pond or anything like that, but just level those resources out and use that in the soils that are up there and our manure nutrients from the farm to rebuild that soil's organic matter to grow crops for our cows in the future. So 10 to 15 years from now, you could drive up there and see a 340 acre cornfield where right now you wouldn't have any vision of that. But that's a long-term goal of our farm. As a director of the co-op, the co-op is a absolutely essential part of our dairy business and it has a huge impact on what New England dairy farms are going to be looking like. As a co-op, we can do things together better than we can do as an individual farm. So we can put our resources together, our thoughts together, and just be able to operate in a very different fashion than we could independently. So the farm has to run and, and you know keep everything going, pay its bills, do all this type of thing. But beside that is your milk market is a very important piece of the income that you have on your farm. So at the same time, you have a, a, your cooperative working for you um, to market your milk and leverage, uh, leverage the marketplace to get the most out of that milk that you sell. And how do we do that? We do that with brands and Cabot, the Cabot brand um, that Agrimark has um, provides added value back to every farmer um, that, that we serve. The future of agriculture in our area is, is going to look quite a bit different, I think, in the future. 
Um, the land that is here, as long as our communities can support local agriculture and keep that open space, every bit of land that's here will be used in agriculture. It may not be used the same today um, as it would be maybe five, ten years from now. And when I say that is, sometimes it's the number of number of farms that are around. As a farm goes away, there's usually not too many farms that replace them, but the same amount of land is being utilized and usually the same amount of milk is being produced in that same same footprint. So there's going to be more consolidation of dairy farms, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure. And But the, the, the fields and the open space that's here will be utilized by, by farmers and they may be growing, diversifying into um, grain corn or growing soybeans, uh, crops like that, but the, the resources will be utilized. The farms in our, in our area do affect our community and build our community because I think the people around us enjoy looking at, you know, the scenery around them. They enjoy the, the open space um, that's around them. This rural community is supported by local agriculture. So um, our community has, gets to see firsthand of where their food comes from. Um, and has a chance to come and visit the farms and, and see those types of things. So that's certainly a, a, you know something that they can they can see that a lot of other people don't get to see. Today there's a very very big disconnect to our consumers on how our food is produced and our practice that practices that we have on our farm for caring for our animals. And this disconnect has come because there's just less and less farms than there were. Let's go back up 70 years ago. 70 years ago, there might have been there might have been just the one generation where you would know somebody in that generation that was a dairy farmer. Today, we're three generations removed. Or, for an example, one out of 150 people back then knew what a dairy farm knew a dairy farmer or had a connection to dairy farming. Today, that number is one out of 8,500. So we have this huge disconnect of where their food comes from, or where our food comes from, period. So as a consumer, when you sit down and you sit down with yourself or a family three times a day and have a meal, and you pick up the fork and you're eating that food, if you could just take a minute and think about the dedication, the hard work, and, and what goes into what's on that plate in front of you, because as a dairy farmer, we want to get the consumers onto our farm. Why do we want to do that? People may think there's something to hide, but as, there's, as we bring the public onto our farms, they realize that we need to care for our animals. We do everything possible for our animals, for um, their comfort, their safety, and treat our employees extremely well at the farm. And we just need to have a better connection so that you guys can understand what's really happening. So any time that you might see an open house at a farm in your area, and there is a lot of that going on now, we're trying to tell the farmer's story. And there's only one way to get that done, is have you guys come to the farm and see what happens behind the scenes.